Okay, so here's an example of um, what um, Hubel and Wiesel came up with when they were actually um, moving these electrodes, m moving these recording electrodes through the surface of the cortex. So on the top of this slide, which is off of your book on page 80, um, you can see uh, a little cartoon drawing um, where the arrow that's going down is the electrode. It's a very thin wire electrode. Uh, so it pierces the it pierces the cortex here. Right? So it goes into the cortex and it goes deeper into the cortex and as it passes through each one of these areas it passes through different receptive fields that are represented on the retina. Now here uh, in part B of the um, of this chart are the is a, a representation of the different patches of receptive field that are being um, represented in this cortex. So for example this right here is uh, this this part of the retina is patch 1 and Hubel and Wiesel were able to record activity related to that patch at that spot. They would go down a little further and they would hit patch 2 and then they would hit patch 3 and they would hit patch 4. Notice how they're stacked on top of each other in exactly that order. One, two, three, and four on the retina and they are also stacked up, uh, upon each other or arranged that way in this column. Uh, so this one column here, this one column is responsible for um, taking in the input from this area right here, from this part uh, of the retina right here. And that was a really remarkable discovery if you think about it. I mean, uh, we didn't know anything about how visual processing was done up until uh, the research of Hubel and Wiesel and now we're seeing this beautiful organization that th they're able to relate the structure of the retina and the stimulation of the receptive fields in the retina to processing structures all the way back in the cortex. Uh, here's another example, right? So this is a slice of cortex, right? And as they pass, uh, and this is from your book on page 81, right? And these are orientation columns. So, uh, for example, uh, if they were to pass um, uh, an electrode uh, through um, through column A along track A, right? They would find um, neurons responding in this column only to horizontal bars, or I, sh I should say they responded best to horizontal bars. And then let's say they found another spot and they inserted the electrode and it recorded all the way down. Whoops. Sorry about that. Uh, let's say they recorded all the way down, right, down this column. They would find uh, spot after spot of, of, of uh, neurons that, on, that only responded when the um, line that the animal was looking at was oriented at a certain degree, like say 30 degrees, okay. And they would find these columns, right? They would go in here and they would find these uh, these columns uh, where neurons would only respond to um, uh, cells that uh, to uh, stimuli that were oriented at a, in a certain pattern. Uh, so if you were to go the other, so instead of going down, right? Whoops! Oh darn it! I did it again, didn't I? Let me do that. Okay. So instead of going down. Right. Let's say the the electrodes that we were looking at before were going in like this. Right. They were going in like that. Instead of doing that, right. Um, what if, right? What if we push the electrode in the other direction, uh, this direction here, like this? Right. Well, we're gonna see. Uh, the orientation or the responding of neurons at these points here 
uh, is going to be different than going down, right? So going down, we kept seeing neurons that say, for example, only responded to, to this orientation. And then all the neurons in this column would only respond to this orientation. And all the neurons in this column only responded to this orientation, right? No matter where you were, it was always the same orientation that the neurons responded best to. Well, the way that uh, Hubel and Wiesel determined that there were columns here was that they put electrodes in at a oblique angle, right? At a 90 degree angle to the previous electrodes that they were putting in, right? So this is a 90 degree angle here, right? And what they found was, as they crossed across to different columns, they would find, uh, in this column, they would find, of course, uh, a neuron that responded well to this orientation, then one that responded well to a slightly more angled orientation, then the next column, next column, next column, next column. And they were able to find these columns all sitting to, to, next to each other that had neurons that only responded uh, to slight variations and all the variations were organized right so all the columns were all lined up next to each other and as you went from column to column to column you would go and find uh, cells that would respond to lines that were uh, moved slightly slightly more and more and more which is again a really neat discovery so here's a picture of a column right so inside of a column there are um, inside of a big column which is one millimeter, right? There are smaller columns. So this is a location column. In other words, this whole column here, this whole column is responsible, this whole column here is responsible for one particular patch or one particular location uh, receptive field on the retina. And then within, within each location column, we have orientation columns. In other words, columns that were responsible for detecting particular orientations and corners and edges uh, and angles. Okay, so each, each one of these little patches had a set of orientation columns that's responsible for detecting uh, the orientations of lines and intersections and things of that nature. So the visual cortex, the other thing they discovered in the visual cortex was that there's ocular dominance con uh, columns, right? So the neurons that are connected to one eye, um, um, the, the, well, there's neurons in the cortex that respond preferentially to one eye. Um, so each neuron has an eye that it prefers uh, to be stimulated by. Uh, which is pretty cool, right? Um, the columns also work together, right, to to cover the whole visual field. So they, it, it's like layering on top of each other, right? So each little patch is layered. Um, each of the little patches that cover a particular spot of the receptive field are all patched and layered on top of each other. So for example, uh, if you're looking at this uh, visual scene here, right, one of the things you might detect is this straight object, which is a uh, the trunk of a very thin tree. If we look a little bit closer, uh, this patch of your visual field here would be responsible for this part of the trunk. This patch of your visual field would be responsible for that and this patch of your visual field are responsible for that. So each one of these little patches is going to be detecting these um, horizontal shapes, right? And that's all going to come together to form uh, the, the, the entirety of this trunk, right? So if we look here, right, if we go back and look at that trunk, right, this part of the, th that part of the trunk is being projected onto your retina, right? And you've got this little patch A, this little patch B, and this little patch C, of course, each uh, being controlled by one of these location columns, right? So, and there's the little location columns all sitting there. And the location columns all have orientation columns, right, that light up in different orientations of the line. And all three of these guys, all three of these little patches are working together because they're right next to each other, right? Uh, they're all working together and they all detect 90 degree orientations because that's what they see there. They see this 90 degree thing passing through them so they all light up. And when they all light up, or when they're all activated I should say, when they're all maximally stimulated, 
um, they of course all send their output on further down the chain for processing. And you might imagine, right, this whole scene, right, this whole scene that you're looking at is going to be covered by all of these little um, uh, uh, patches, location patches, uh, each one being uh, controlled, each one being processed, I should say, each one of these patches being processed by uh, a particular region of the cortex that has these location columns and orientation columns in them. Um, one of the other really interesting um, things we've learned about, and this is this is going to be an important concept for uh, for you because we're going to talk about this concept uh, again in other in other chapters. But once once the information is processed in the uh, cortex, or in the visual cortex, right, it gets passed up further. Uh, up into the rest of the cortex for further processing. The information seems to get split up into two separate streams, right? To feed two separate types of information, right? What and where, okay? So in other words, uh, the visual cortex is feeding two separate streams of information to the rest of your brain. Okay, one of those streams is about what it is you're looking at. So it's it's providing information about it. Per, it's providing information to the rest of your cortex that's going to help you to identify what you're looking at. Okay, what's it called? What's it for? Okay. The other stream, the other separate stream, uh, is has to do with where it is, its location in space, its and its location relative to your body. Okay, um, these are two separate streams of information that go in two separate neural pathways. Okay, and the way we know uh, this is through a lot of different studies. Some of the earliest studies that were done were lesioning studies or ablation studies, and this is where we go in. Uh, with an electrode and burn out and destroy small parts of the brain um, in animal subjects so that we can see what those parts of the brain do, right? So we'll take an animal that's trained, we'll take an animal that's trained to indicate some perceptual capacity. So we'll take an animal, for example, that's trained to locate a uh, uh, um, a, 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 a food cup in, in, in its environment, right? Then we uh, destroy a specific part of the brain, and then we put the animal back in and see if it's still able to locate the food cup in its environment and feed out of that food cup. Okay, those are some of the different studies that we do, and this is how we've been able to discover these what and where uh, neural pathways that uh, emerge from um, the visual cortex. So Ungerlieder und Mischkin. Right, did a very uh, interesting study with monkeys. Right, so um, they did a what was called an object discrimination problem. Right, and let me uh, see. Let me see if I can uh, show you here. This starts in this starts on page 83. Right, um, and basically they removed part of the monkey's parietal lobe. Whoops. Well, okay. Let me start here. So uh, there was an object discrimination problem. Right. So the monkey shown an object. Right. Um, and then, and then uh, a particular object, right? And then they take it away, right? And then they bring the monkey back and they show the monkey the object plus some other object, right? And the monkey's given a reward if he's able to detect the object that he saw before, okay? Um, so that's object discrimination, right? Can I recognize the same thing I saw before, right? And the other task that uh, they trained monkeys on was the landmark discrimination problem, right? So they would put two little food buckets or little food wells uh, in a cage, right? And then they would take a um, a, a, a landmark, like like a little like a marker, like a you know like a little bottle or something, right? Or a little uh, a little marker, and they would put the marker next to one of the food cups, and they would put food inside that food cup, and the monkey was supposed to learn the relationship between this marker and the food cup. If this marker was close to a food cup, the monkey would know 
that there's food in that food cup. So the monkey had to learn the relationship between, oh, that food, that, th that marker is there, that means that there's a food cup, that there's food inside that food cup. Okay, so there's the object discrimination problem and the landmark discrimination problem.